So today I'm going to be talking to you about our experience building and optimizing JIT for Java uh, that is currently part of the shipping uh, Zing JVM. The rough outline of the talk is I'm going to give a little bit of background on what Falcon is, uh, sort of development line uh, timeline getting here, tell you the reasons why you should build a JIT, and then the majority of the talk is organized around common objections we hear as to why using LLVM to build a JIT is a bad idea. We we'll go through and evaluate each of them one by one. So starting off with, what is Falcon? Uh, as I said, Falcon is a Java bytecode JIT. Uh, important note here is that it is a tier two JIT, and we'll get into details as to what that means as we go through. It is available in the shipping product. You can go and download it off the web today and play with it if you feel like, including getting access to all of the LLVM IR it generates and playing with all of the LLVM tooling. This talk is going to be about the lessons we learned along the way of building Falcon. So give you a little bit of background so that the talk makes sense. Uh, Zing is a JVM. Our traditional claim to fame is we've got a really awesome concurrent GC. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Uh, if you're curious, there's lots of good papers on it. The important bit of context you're going to need to know is that there are multiple tiers of execution within a JVM. There's an interpreter that runs the bytecode very slowly and handles all of the rarely executed code. There's a tier one compiler whose primary job in life is to generate code which profiles quickly so that the tier two compiler gets fed a very accurate profile of the executing code, so it can make aggressive speculations based on that information. The reason we built Falcon was sort of tied to two different business needs. The first was we had an existing tier two compiler we needed to replace. Uh, we are using the C2 compiler, which is a rather good compiler, but it's also a rather old compiler. And as sort of the hardware has changed in x86, uh, adapting it to uh, target newer features of x86 is getting progressively more challenging. And more generally, it's a very difficult compiler to work with in that testing the compiler as you're changing it is complicated, and there are often awful bug tails. The other business reason to replace it was we wanted to establish a competitive advantage where we were not merely on par with the mean sort of uh, transaction times and throughput with a competition, but actually ahead. That is the long-term goal. The short-term goal was to be able to demonstrate parity and evidence of improvement. The timeline for this project, we started looking at this back in 2013. Spent about six months building a basic prototype just to prove out the idea. Uh, then about the next year was spent building a functionally complete but dog slow compiler. And we've been performance tuning ever since. Uh, the first alpha uh, versions went out to customers in sort of early last year. We shipped the product in December and it's been on by default for a good chunk of the time since then. One thing I just want to highlight is this is a fairly large investment for us. We had uh, between th three and six people working on this project throughout the entirety of that timeline. I would estimate we probably put about 20 person years worth of time into this project. Uh, that is more substantial than many of the JIT projects that have been tried, and I think is actually one of the reasons that we succeeded. Uh, I'd be very remiss not to call out that this was a massive team effort, uh, both from the development team and also from the organization that supported us in terms of the rest of Zing development and QA. It wouldn't have been possible without all the people on this slide. I just get the credit of talking to you about, talking to you about it today. So this is probably the slide I think most people are most interested in, which is the performance slide. What we're looking at here is the ratio of peak performance with the most recent Zing version to a randomly chosen Oracle version for a spectrum of benchmarks that are somewhat randomly chosen. They're not super important, which is why they're not labeled. The key thing is the line going across the middle of the slide, 100%, which is the break-even point. What you're looking for in the pattern here is to see that 
In many cases, Falcon is ahead, and in a few cases, Falcon is behind. But we are performance competitive with C2 in the Oracle JVM across, uh, sort of across the overall spectrum. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is that's actually a rather high bar to clear, in that C2 and JVMs are some of the best JIT compilers out there. Uh, so, moving on to some of the lessons we've learned. This is the boring slide that's nothing new. All of the reasons why you should use LLVM to build a JIT. Well, first of all, there's all of you folks. Uh, the fact that we can leverage the work that you put in on a daily basis is monumentally important. Uh, we've picked up all of the work that has been done on new microarchitectures for x86, and that has been massively beneficial to us. There's also the fact that Clang, and as a result, LLVM is very widely deployed and is thus very widely tested. That is a major benefit that has been a, a huge uh, sort of advantage for us. The other piece is that there is a por perfor uh, proven performance of Clang being able to generate high quality code, though the caveat I need to attach to that is it is C and C++ performance, not Java performance, and we'll come to that in a little bit. So this slide is sort of the intro to the meat of the talk. These are some of the common objections I've heard when telling people we were building an LLVM-based JIT. The way I came up with the list that are up here is I went to Google and I searched why uh, LLVM is bad for JITs, and then I read through the first couple of hits and took everything they said. So Let's start with the first objection, which is generally that LLVM just doesn't support some feature they need for their language. And I gotta start with a bit of skepticism here, because almost always the thing being replaced is a C implementation. We're not in that circumstance, we're actually replacing another compiler, but if there is a C lowering for the language feature, it can be represented in LLVM. Uh, the example I've got up on the slide here real fast is a quick and dirty lowering for deoptimization semantics. Deoptimization is when the execution needs to leave compiled code and return to a lower tier of execution. So essentially what you're doing is you're building up the uh, abstract state of the interpreter to hand back to the interpreter to resume execution. And we did a lot of work to make that fast, but this is a cheap implementation that works well enough to get you started. The real question we're left with is not whether LLVM supports something, but how well it supports it. And that's going to be the meat of our talk later as we go further. Some of the functional corner cases that we did run into and other JIT projects will run into as well are primarily things around calling conventions and ABI details. One of the really important lessons I want to share is that we had the luxury of changing our ABI. That saved us a monumental amount of work because there were cases that teaching LLVM about some quirk of our ABI would have been difficult. A good example of this is we had a particular assembly helper routine that received its arguments in the red zone of the X6 stack pushed beyond the current frame. Being able to replace that little piece of assembly with, a, with something that had a normal C calling convention that had no performance impact whatsoever simplified our lives a lot. And there's dozens of examples like that as we went through the project. So I do want to take an aside and sort of mention one of the other lessons, which is to be very leery of overdesign when first bringing up the new JIT. Uh, the example that, in retrospect, for us was over design was actually something I got up in front of this audience, uh, I think it was three years ago, and told you all about. It was the GC state point design for interoperating with the GC. The entire premise of this design was based on the notion that the quality of the lowering of a safe point, which is the sort of metadata around a call for interacting with a GC, was very important for the performance of jitted code. This was based on the advice of literally every person we had talked to who had ever worked on a JIT. Our experience is that hasn't been true. 
we're still using the poor lowering that spills everything to the stack, and that's been just fine. Because every time we've done performance analysis, what we found is when we have a hot call site, the problem is there's an inliner bug or there's a virtualization bug, not that there is a issue with the quality of the safe point lowering. Now, we are likely to finally push the rest of the way to the in-register lowering in the near future, but that's going to be because of code size, not for any other reason. Uh, to give you an idea how expensive with misstep this was, we probably invested over two person years of effort into something that we didn't need to do at this point in the project. So as a quick aside, I wanna just emphasize one thing, because it's a, a common mistake I see a lot of people make, which is that it is critically important when you're building a new compiler, particularly when you're building a new JIT, to get to functional correctness first and to have testing around the compiler to prove it is correct as you start performance tuning. One of the best ways of thinking about this I've come up with is to think about designing the front end as if there was an adversary who is trying to break the code you're emitting. Because at the end of the day, that's what an optimizer is. We design our optimizers to be good at ripping apart dead code exploiting undefined behavior, and finding all of the excuses to destroy the code. So you really want to be in the mindset of thinking about this sort of perfect adversary that will find any excuse to screw with you in your front end and building the front end to, by construction, generate correct code. As we go through the performance tuning, this will be particularly important, and the time that is spent here pays off two to three to one. So, next common objection is LLVM is this huge library, why would I want to add that as a dependency to my uh, language? This sort of comes down to what your definition of large is. For us, we ship a 200 megabyte uh, library, which is the JVM. The 40 meg library for LLVM, yeah, it doesn't really matter that much to us. Uh, I'll also say we haven't done much to reduce this. We're still shipping the old tier two compiler as well as the new one, uh, and we've made no real effort to reduce the library size of LLVM by ripping out all of the non-X86 intrinsic things like that. I think we could drive these numbers lower if we cared to. Now, if we were targeting embedded platforms rather than servers, this might be a much bigger issue, so it depends on sort of what your target platform is. So. Next common thing we hear is that sort of, I tried building an LLVM backend. I tacked it onto the back of my compiler and it generated bad code. So first thing here is we gotta talk about what we're actually building. And this is where I mentioned earlier that we were building a tier two JIT. This is critically important. The tier two JIT only sees a very small subset of the code that's being uh, run and its job is to generate really high quality code regardless of the cost. Additionally, it gets fed profiling data collected by the lower tiers. And that profiling data and the optimizations it enables are critical for performance. Looking across the suite of benchmarks, we see pretty much every benchmark is at least a 25% performance impact from turning off the profiling information feeding the tier two. Some of the benchmarks are as high as even 40 or 50% impacts. Just to be clear, that's larger than any other single piece of the entire infrastructure. So let's talk about a few of the ways that we actually exploit that profiling information to achieve that performance. The first and probably most important one is an optimization to eliminate paths that have not been seen to run dynamically at runtime. Uh, the key thing here is that if you have a path in the compiled code that has, according to the profile, never run, you can replace that with a call to deoptimize, which will replace the currently executing frame with a frame for the interpreter and resume at a specified point in the interpreter. 
then if that turns out to be a hot path, after all, we'll come back through, reprofile in tier one, and then regenerate a new version of the tier two code. Uh, this has the effect of basically doing trace compilation without being trace compilation. Uh, it is, I don't have specific numbers here on this one, unfortunately, but it's a large fraction of that gain. The next key piece is using the profiling to collect information about the receiving, uh, the receiver type in virtual interface dispatch, and then doing predicated to virtualization. For those of you who attended previous talks, you may have remembered me in the past talking about class hierarchy analysis and other speculative whole world uh, devirtualization techniques. Those are also really important, but predicated to virtualization serves as the backstop for when the heroic whole world assumptions fail. In Java, given that everything is virtual by default, being able to successfully devirtualize is critically important for performance. Now, I want to point out that there are two different variants of predicated to virtualization. The one on the left is simply doing a type dispatch, and then if it's, one of the, if it's a type we haven't seen before, we go ahead and do the vCall. The one on the right, however, is leveraging the uh, optimization we just talked about in the last slide, and if we see an unexpected type, we go back to the interpreter and reprofile. The critical difference here is what happens if this is wrapped in a loop, because in the first, on the, on the left, we have an opaque call we can't model that's within the loop and executes on every iteration. On the example on the right, we have a loop exit, which leads to a slow path. If we're able to inline the bodies for a foo and b foo in this example, the second means we have a nice, fully optimizable loop that we can sort of go to town on. The one on the left means we still have a full memory barrier. So there are reasons to use both in different uh, circumstances, but the one on the right is generally more profitable if possible. So another speculative optimization, and this one we've actually talked about in this setting before, is implicit null checks. Implicit null checks are a really simple observation, which is that if you have a language that has lots and lots of checks for null, and those null checks are never actually taken because nothing's ever null in practice, that you can use a signal handler to detect if something was actually null when accessed. Uh, so implicit null checks is just removing the explicit null check in favor of some metadata on the load that says, hey, if you seg v here with a null pointer, what that meant was go over to this handler over here to handle the null check. Now, one thing that's maybe not obvious here at first is that you have to be willing to trust your profile to know that null checks are not going to happen here because the cost of that seg v is roughly somewhere between a million and a billion times more expensive than the dynamic cost of the explicit null check. So if it turns out nulls are hot here, that's really painful. So the next thing is we leverage the existing LLVM infrastructure to do code layout. Uh, using the branch weights metadata and all of the uh, block placement infrastructure uh, pushes all of the cold code and the function to the end. This is particularly important for us because of how many cold paths we have. Uh, in Java, we have slow paths for all of the exception handling, or sorry, not exception handling, safe point handling code. We have a slow paths for all of the built-in exception types. These are the range checks, the null, the null checks, all of those things. And then additionally, our pass pipeline makes very heavy use of code versioning to eliminate some of those checks. So the net effect is we have a lot of cold code. Uh, in fact, over 50% of our total code size is those slow paths. We'll come back to that point in a little bit at the end because it has an impact on one of the other objections. So that's the profile guided stuff. Now let's talk more generally about just getting good performance out of our sort of backend. 
LLVM already has a very extensive set of metadata and attributes for providing semantics uh, as necessary to the optimizer, so front-end semantics so the optimizer can exploit them. Uh, there is very much an iterative process of analyzing a workload, figuring out what missing piece of information could have let the optimizer exploit it, sometimes fixing the optimizer, though that is the much less common case, adding that missing piece of metadata or missing attribute, and then fixing all the miscompiles that fall out. That last one is the unfortunate reality that no one expects, but is where actually the majority of the time goes. And I mentioned earlier that getting a good testing infrastructure in place at the very beginning pays off in spades. This is the point it pays off. If you don't have a good testing infrastructure, your ability to make forward progress while doing this performance tuning slows to an absolute stall. Uh, for us, this was a sort of roughly nine to 12 month effort for the entire team. And it's something that we are still spending a substantial amount of time doing today, even with a shipping product. So the other point I wanna make, and I mentioned this one not because it's interesting, but because it's a very common mistake for folks who are new to LLVM. Uh, if you're going to have your own language, you are going to have your own pass order. The MCJIT by default doesn't use a pass order that's useful for your language. You're going to have to find your own. Similarly, the pass manager builder infrastructure models a pass pipeline that works for C and C++, not one that works for, say, Java. The once you start working with a custom pass pipeline, you do start tripping across a set of LLVM bugs related to pass ordering. Thankfully, these are sort of sparse, uh, sparse. There's not too many of them. But when we combine that with the occasional actual LLVM bug we found when doing the performance analysis, we come to our next sort of key lesson, which is that there is no way I know of to build a successful compiler using LLVM as a black box, period, end of story. You have to expect to become an LLVM developer yourself. Uh, in particular, you have to fix your own bugs because while those of us here would like to fix all bugs in existence, that's not the reality. We don't have time to do that. Uh, the other sort of just observation I'll make is it turns out to be very hard to recruit people who already have LLVM experience. Uh, there are a lot of employers out there who are desperate to hire the people in this room. Uh, we ended up having to train pretty much everybody who worked on the project on LLVM. And I think that is probably the right starting point for any new project coming in from outside the community. Uh, I will mention I had a lot more material on this particular topic that I had to cut for length. So if this is a topic you're interested in, please see the backup slides, which will be included in the online uh, material. So I wanted to do a quick status check as to where we are so far with the objections we've examined and the work we've done. What we've got, just with what we've said so far, is we have a working compiler that generates pretty reasonable code for a C-like subset of the source language. Now, we haven't gotten to any of the heroics around removing all the range checks and all the hard cases, but the simple stuff should work. The key thing is this is actually a lot further than a lot of projects get to start with. So if this is your goal, this is a very achievable objective. Give a quick example of the type of stuff that you start seeing benefit from at this point. This is a simple example that is just doing a uh, min reduction over a vector. There's nothing special about this code. You could write it in C, you could write it in Java, you could write it in whatever. The critical thing is not that we did anything special to get performance out of this example. It's that all of you folks in the audience did work to get performance out of this example. And the loop vectorizer and the x86 backend happened to generate beautiful vector code for this example, fully unrolled, uh, sort of using ABX2, et cetera. The compiler we tend to compare against the most, which is the C2 compiler, amusingly enough, also generates vector code for this. It's just slightly less good vector code. 
And that's enough for a 4x difference in performance on a Skylake system. That's pretty cool right there. That's pretty good evidence of, or that is the reason we went down this path to start with, is to be able to leverage all of your work on cases like this. So, the next objection we get, moving beyond that C-like subset, is we tend to hear that LLVM just generates far too much code. Well, as I sort of referenced to start with, yeah, that's sort of true. Uh, we do generate something in the order of three to five X more code than the C2 compiler we're replacing. Uh, that is not a big deal for us, though it is something we would like to improve on. Uh, I have to caveat here and say that we know at least a portion of this is self-inflicted because our past pipeline does aggressively use code versioning to eliminate checks. However, looking at the generated code, that is by no means the only thing going on. Going back to my earlier statement of more than half of our total code size being cold code, we're really not doing a good job today of optimizing for size in those cold paths. Today, we have a single switch, which is the uh, 0, 03 flag at the function level. And the problem we have is we have, in the same functions, code that is both blazing hot and stone cold. That's an area that we could definitely improve on as a community. Things that are a little bit more specific to our particular use case and other managed languages, uh, that GC state point lowering I mentioned earlier that has ended up not mattering from a performance standpoint, does have a sizable impact on the code size. The other piece is that there's a lot of uh, code versioning transformations that LLVM does that could be rewritten in terms of deoptimizing back to the interpreter for a slow path rather than duplicating loops. So the classic example here is loop on switch. Uh, my feel is that these are roughly uh, listed in order of importance. Uh, but I don't have concrete numbers to back that up. It's a sort of a topic for further investigation. So, next objection, and I'm sure this is one you've all heard before. LLVM's a really slow compiler, and it's a slow, it's thus not suitable for building a JIT. I've had this from a couple dozen people in this room this, this last two days. Well, yeah, it is sort of a slow compiler. It's in fact a very uh, slow compiler if what you're looking for is the speed of compilation, that's the only thing you care about. What we tend to think about though, so the way we look at this is we're building that tier two compiler. We're not building the tier one compiler. If what we were looking for is a compiler that generated code very quickly to, to collect the profiling, LLVM would be terrible for that role, honest reality. Because we're building the tier two compiler, we're willing to burn more compile time to get high quality code. We often refer to what we have built as an in-memory compiler rather than as a JIT, just to make that distinction. One of the things I wanna mention here is there's a lot of VM support that goes into making it so that we don't care about the compile time of the tier two compiler. Uh, there are multiple compiler threads running doing concurrent compilation that are not blocking the application. There are sort of priority queues, sort of uh, prioritizing the compiles that matter the most so that they get done the quickest. And there's nothing interesting from a JVM perspective up here. This is all old news. We didn't do anything novel here. But we had the benefit of using an existing JVM that had all of this infrastructure that let us not care about the compile time of uh, LLVM. So to be a little bit more specific, we see typical compile times coming in just under 100 milliseconds uh, per compile. We see the extreme cases coming in uh, in the seconds and in some cases even in the low minutes, which that's pretty painful because we're wasting massive amounts of CPU time doing it, but it's mostly survivable. However, there is that mostly. Uh, 
One of the things we learned after launch is that people like to abuse their JVMs in terrible, terrible ways. Uh, the two particular examples we found that are quite interesting is there's a data analytics framework that likes to spawn off a JVM per query, even when that query runs for 100 milliseconds or a second. The other one we've seen is parallel processing frameworks that spawn off a, a JVM per parallel element and like to do things like launch 1,000 JVMs at once. When you combine that with CPU usage from the previous slide, uh, that gets a little painful. So unfortunately, improving compile time, as we all know, is sort of a hard thing. So what do we do about this? Our answer to this is actually not to improve compile time at all, but to change the usage model. So because what we have with LLVM is an in-memory compiler, we have an object file in memory. We can dump that object file out to disk and reload it on the next execution of the JVM. We've got a prototype at this point that does exactly that and shows this working and shows that we can leverage all the profiling information, get peak performance out of the generated code, and if you're running the same application in a stable state, that the second and nth run, second to nth runs, will basically never run the compiler. You could think of this as being a odd form of profile guided ahead of time compilation, because there's a profiling run that does all the work, saves all the result, and then everybody else just runs the fast code from there on out. Uh, I want to say here, this is something that if we hadn't used LLVM, would not have been possible. We looked at the notion of doing a system like this using the other two compilers we also ship and gave up very, very quickly as it was just a monumentally difficult thing to even figure out how to do. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't say we're taking a lot of inspiration from a previous project on this one. Uh, the Piston guys who were doing a Python JIT uh, pioneered this, and they've got a blog post on this from about three years ago. Uh, that was where the idea came from for us to sort of say, hey, we should do that someday. So the last objection we come to is that there's some special feature about your language that cannot be well optimized in LLVM and requires a custom compiler from the ground up to handle. And this is where I say, yeah, there are some differences between languages, and dealing with that is where a lot of the work of building a JIT for Java comes in. In our cases, the things that were different that we had to sort of teach LLVM a lot about were all of the built-in exceptions that Java has, the range checks, the null checks, uh, and the optimization was a really important one. Uh, and then divirtualization and inlining was another really important one for us because we chose to do everything over LLVMIR. And I'll touch on that piece a little bit more in just a second. I will say I am very skeptical of the notion that you can't do a arbitrary language feature over LLVMIR with sufficient work. The, with that point, the first thing I really strongly recommend is to try a bunch of C implementations. We were continuously shocked by how often we thought we had a hard problem. We'd write out a couple of C implementations for it and one of them would just work. And more importantly, when they didn't work, they taught us what the hard part of the optimization problem was. Because we could take an example, stare at what LLVM was doing with it, and why that one critical transform wasn't being done. This sometimes leads back into using existing metadata and attributes as already mentioned, but sometimes you need to do custom work based on the result of that. Rarely though, in fact for us, never, did we ever hit something that we just fundamentally couldn't do within the LLVM framework. The way you handle the hard cases that LLVM doesn't handle today is by adding new classes of attributes and metadata 
for embedding the various semantic pieces that your front end provides that C and C++ don't. Using custom attributes and metadata has a lot of advantages over writing custom IR. Uh, one of the simplest ones is actually around testing. And I didn't have time to put it in this talk, unfortunately. But if you're building a, pro a project along these lines, please come talk to me about testing, because it turns out that's critically important. Some of the things we ended up doing in the way of custom attributes and metadata were we represent the Java type system over LLVM IR by annotating sort of loads and calls with the Java types they return. And then we build an analysis over those to do Java type analysis for alias analysis and divirtualization. Uh, we have a custom attribute that tells the optimizer that if this function throws, it will throw by deoptimizing the caller frame. That lets the compiler eliminate all the exception handling in the caller under the assumption that it won't throw an exception. And then if it does throw an exception, we go back and run in the interpreter and reprofile and recollect. But building, sorry, using custom attributes and metadata, I think is one of the best decisions we made. And I would strongly advise anyone else who's considering doing anything like this to do the same. Uh, they also have this other really nice property that they're easy to test, they're relatively well isolated, and they're easy to maintain in downstream branches, which, boy, is that important. However, when you start looking at using metadata, you quickly run into one critical problem. When you add a new piece of metadata, the optimizer likes to strip it out because the contract the optimizer has is that it can only preserve metadata that it, can, that it knows to still be correct in the new circumstance of whatever the transform did. And by definition, if it's custom metadata, it doesn't know what the semantics of that metadata is. So you can either go through the entire optimizer and try to teach it about each of your individual pieces of uh, metadata, but that's a very error-prone, tedious process that is real buggy. The approach we've ended up settling on instead is what we call healing. And essentially, this is teaching the optimizer to be able to query back to the runtime and re-infer the lost metadata once it's been dropped by the optimizer. More generally, we've been moving more and more to a model where we don't even bother emitting the metadata in the front end to start with, and we let the optimizer rederive all of it via that callback mechanism. This has the very nice property of being very robust against both upstream and downstream changes. Uh, and I think is overall a really good design I'd recommend to other folks doing this. That does bring us to talking a little bit about callbacks, though. Which is, callbacks are how we've extended LLVM to ask the JVM questions during optimization time. The other main alternative here would have been to serialize every possible fact that the optimizer might need to know into the IR at construction point. That could, in the worst case, include the entire class hierarchy of your Java application and every sort of method and et cetera, et cetera that's a prohibitively a large amount of state. So instead, we lazily query as needed uh, as the optimizer runs. Here's a quick example of what a callback looks like. This particular one takes a symbolic uh, identifier for some known object, an offset and a size, and says, hey, fr front end, tell me what you can about this memory location. That field info is returned in the form of things that can be put as metadata onto a load or a call. And recursive application of that propagates it across the IR, uh, and that's pretty much it for metadata healing. In terms of callbacks, the two main uses we have, the first is the metadata healing I've already mentioned. The other is for a couple of Java-specific type optimizations that we couldn't figure out how to otherwise represent. 
uh, I should say, haven't figured out another way to represent yet. Because eventually I'm hoping to get rid of those. The key thing I want to just throw out here is that it's very tempting to keep adding a new callback every time you hit some new problem. There's a real downside to that. And it's a real subtle one. The downside is the optimizer visits dead code. Dead code can com contain complete and utter garbage. So your callback interface has to be robust against being past malicious input. Because remember, the optimizer is you know, a, malicious a malicious adversary. It will nicely find all of the dead code it can analyze to, ex to find how you weren't expecting malicious input. Uh, the only way we found to deal with this problem was to fuzz this interface. Uh, but it also means there's a much higher software engineering and conceptual cost of adding a new callback than there might first seem. Every callback needs to be very carefully considered, uh, both on sort of an initial and ongoing basis. Uh, we're currently at about 25 of these. That's definitely too many. Uh, going through the list in preparation for this callback, I found about 10 I think we can rip out and we'll probably do so. So there's one other slight problem with callbacks, which is that if you're not careful, you lose one of the really important properties that makes LLVM an awesome compiler tool chain, which is, and this is sort of obvious, we're all used to this, it might be even hard to see, but it's the ability to replay a compile. Be able to take a piece of IR that Clang or my front end generates, pipe it to opt with the appropriate pass line, and get exactly the same output. That is critical for diagnostics and debugging. And if we add callbacks that are stateful, we've lost that property. The way we get around this is by essentially adding a second file to the input of opt that is a log of all of the questions that were asked in the JVM and the answers that were returned back to the optimizer. At that point, uh, that query log contains all the information we need to be able to replay. And the other interesting bit is it contains all the information we need to be able to see what would happen if we change the result. If we say, hey, I know that field we actually know a little bit more information about, but the callback implementation you know, didn't handle that case yet. What would have happened to this optimization if we'd gotten that piece of information passed back? We can replay the rest of the optimizer and see what happens. That's a really awesome sort of diagnostic and performance analysis tuning uh, tool that would be a real shame to give up. So the next major building block we use is we use what we call an embedded high-level IR. At a basic level, this is actually very simple. It's just a family of LLVM functions that have bodies that our front end provides. And some of them are exactly that. They're completely opaque to the optimizer. They, we've told the optimizer, hey, we might replace the implementation of that, so you can't even you know, do inner procedural analysis across them. However, some of them we've also taught things to the optimizer about and use them for sort of problems that would be hard to do directly over the LLVMIR. The best example of which is, or an example on the slide at least, is devirtualization. Here we've got the method that hides the virtual lookup so that given some typing information about the receiver, we can say, hey, front end, do you know what implementation or what method is actually being invoked there using any of your heroic optimizations about the type system at runtime? And these abstractions are critical for building a lot of the higher level uh, sort of optimizations that people think of when they think of managed languages like Java. So for instance, this lets us do virtualization. This lets us do object elision. This lets us do partial escape analysis and object syncing. This lets us do the various lock-based optimizations, lock coarsening, lock elision. They're all structured over these uh, sort of abstractions for this higher level embedded IR. Uh, 
So I actually had mentioned abstractions to this audience once before. And at that point, I was talking them up as saying they were really awesome for prototyping and let us sort of redesign the optimizer multiple times. That's still true. I still don't think the project would have been successful if we'd developed a separate IR because we changed our mind dozens of times and being able to change our minds quickly about something was critical. However, as we've sort of pushed the performance to the limits, we've started coming across a downside to this uh, methodology as well, which is that because each of the abstractions is a uh, sort of opaque function to start with, that it is an optimization barrier to the optimizer. What we have moved to over time is we're actually removing more and more abstractions entirely, uh, and the ones that we have left are getting lowered earlier and earlier in the past pipeline. One of the small details that turned out to be surprisingly important is it's not merely how many abstractions get lowered, it's also how many unique places in the pass pipeline that unabstraction gets lowered. Because every one of those gives you an alternate form you have to think about for the optimizer. The good news is that by construction, this doesn't, this doesn't impact correctness, but it does make the performance tuning problem much harder if you're not careful. My sort of summary of this now would be I think that the embedded IR notion was a really good idea for bringing up the project, but that once we'd settled on a design, we probably should have moved away from this more quickly than we did. Lesson learned. So, conclusion here is we have a proof that it is possible to build an LLVM-based JIT that's successful, depending on the use case you're going for. And that use case, I want to emphasize once again, is critical. For us, we're going after that sort of tier two compiler that was going for peak performance. If we'd been trying to build a tier one compiler, the project would have been a complete failure. So choosing the problem appropriately to match it to the tool set that Elevium provides was probably the biggest lesson I want to impart to everybody out of this talk. With that, any questions? Uh, do you continue um, to profile your tier two code or have any other mechanism to detect a phase change that breaks your uh, cached profiling information? Say if you had a blazing hot code that is now ice cold? Yep. So the question was whether we recognized that the profile was incorrect at the time of generation and if it later changes. The answer to that is partly yes and partly no. The partly yes part is that that untaken path optimization I mentioned, uh, if you do go back to the interpreter, you'll remember the fact that that path is now explored and the recompilation will reflect that. If, however, you have a piece of code that was exercised previously but was only lukewarm, and it is now blazing hot, that is not something we will currently uh, detect the, the change in, and you'll continue to run the previous version of code. Uh, we've had literally hours of conversations about how to do that better, but we'll see someday. Thanks for the amazing presentation. So you mentioned that the compilation time is around 100 milliseconds, right? Mm -hmm. What's the typical size of the code you are trying to compile? Uh, so we are a method-based JIT, mm -hmm. but that is slightly deceptive at first, mm -hmm. because we're a method-based JIT that does insanely aggressive inlining. Okay. So it's not simply a single method. It is the transitive closure of everything callable from that method until the inliner says, eh, that's definitely not worth inlining. <laughs> so the compiles tend to involve a fair amount of bytecode after all the inlining is complete. But the starting unit is a method. OK, I see. Um, do you have any experience to share in terms of the memory access or management when you are using JIT? Uh, so from a correctness standpoint, we haven't had any major issues with LLVM on that front. Okay. 
Uh, from a memory usage perspective, I looked at this once a while ago. Unfortunately, I don't have the, mem the numbers memorized. It hasn't been a major problem for us. But again, we're going after the server use case where a couple of dozen megs of memory just isn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want more specifics, come talk to me later and I can pull up some old slides that I have that have those numbers and share them. Okay. Thanks very much. Hi. Um, I was wondering, so for your tier two, you use LVM uh, for the code gen. How hard is it with LVM to keep information that you need to map back to uh, tier one or the interpreter? So the, the maps you need, for example, when you're doing an implicit null check or if you're going to deopt, like if you need to scan for GC and so on. Okay. Uh, so in one of our previous talks, we've got a lot more information about the answer to your question. But the short version is we added the capability to LLVM to build a side table as part of the object file that describes where on the stack uh, all of the information required for the GC updates and also for the deoptimization back to the interpreter can be found. So the way the mechanism works is the compiled code calls out to the runtime. The runtime looks up the PC of where we came from and says, okay, here's the little information on the stack that I need to form an interpreter frame, form an interpreter frame, rip this compiled frame off the stack, replace it with an interpreter frame, or sorry, with, with an interpreter execution frame, and then jump into the interpreter with that state. So is it uh, a lot more on top of LLVM, or does LLVM uh, provide a lot to do that? It is available in upstream LLVM. What you're looking for is the stack map section uh, description. If you want more information, come talk to me later. I'll give you all the details. Sure, thanks. Um, my question is about the speculative elimination of null check that you're doing, um, mm -hmm. relying on signal handlers. Um, it seems like you're invoking undefined behavior doing this. Uh, and so undefined by whom? I, I mean, at the LLVM <laughs> level? Uh, so the answer is we don't do it at the LLVM level. It is a very late rewrite that is done uh, in the back end. Uh, the specific reason because LLVM loads are undefined if they re dereference null. So we preserve the explicit control flow all the way through LLVM, LLVM IR, through most of the x86 backend, and then as one of the absolute last passes that runs, we do the rewrite into the alternate form. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. You mentioned the prototype of code cache where you save compiled objects on disk. Yep. Do you have any estimate on how much it helps or some other statistics? Uh, not that I'm comfortable in going, on, going into in a recorded talk. If you want to come talk to me later, I can give a little bit more detail. Uh, regarding deoptimization, um, are there cases where simply outlining uh, and laying out the cold code later would suffice? Probably. Uh, we're building in the context of a VM that had all the mechanisms to do deoptimization. Uh, so we didn't... Ex look too hard at what the alternatives were. There are definitely cases where just outlining would not be enough, but what fraction of cases you could handle with outlining, I don't have a good intuition for. If you want, grab me later and we can brainstorm. So my question is, there's been a lot of effort put in JIT compilation for Python, several of them based on LLVM too but they don't seem as successful as you've been. Can you share any insight about things they may have missed or based on your experience? So uh, several of the objections I went through were relevant for that question. Uh, the Probably the biggest thing I'm aware of is the positioning and what problem they were trying to solve. So the Piston project I mentioned, for instance, recognized this fairly late in the lifetime of the project, and then started investing really heavily in building the tier one jet. Uh, the thing I think that Python needs at this point is not actually a good optimizing jet. It needs the tier one jet. That's the first building block you have to have before what we're talking about here becomes useful. Thanks. Welcome. 
I think we can take one or two more questions. Yep. Would it be feasible to get a stripped down optimizer as your tier one compiler? Uh, that is one of the questions I get asked regularly internally. Uh, my answer is not without a lot more work than it sounds like. Because even a empty pass pipeline is still fairly expensive. To give you the context, our tier one compiler is almost always sub single millisecond per compile. Uh, getting LLVM down to the point where it is sub single millisecond would be a lot of work. All right, so I think we're out of questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.